Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through, a, through Samaria, so he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, What do you want, or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were up urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me, and to complete his work. Do you not say four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you have said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. Thank you. That was really well done. Uh, so there's, before we jump in, I, I just want to pray. There's a lot of things going on in our little faith community here. Uh, one of our friends, some of you will know him personally, is flying out tomorrow to go consult with special doctors in, in Denver around his cancer. Another family is dealing with loss of, of a son. And, and then, speaking of sons, there's a little guy. Some of you will know the Myers. They attend this gathering, and I got their permission. He, he broke his femur on the ski hill yesterday. So, yeah, little Grayson is in the... He's okay. He had surgery. He's, he gets to go home. I'm bringing him hamburgers today, and he told me, no cheese. <laughs> so, so let's pray. Uh, God, thanks uh, that you call us uh, to live in community, and thanks for the, this 
neat group of people that you've put together to sh share that in different ways and levels of uh, just life. We do lift up Clint and Jess and just pray that you'd be all over that trip from the physical things to the logistical things like flights and cars and then obviously everything that happens with consulting with medical people, pray that you'd be present to them and to Joan and Isaac as they just kind of process through all of this in life. Uh, we also pray, pray for our friends, the Conrads, and just that this week leading up to um, Memorial would, would be rich with you and honest in its sadness. And then, Lord, we do pray for the Myers and little Grayson, and I guess my prayer would be 20, 20 years from now when he looks back, uh, he can see that this season was instrumental in the way that he understood you and what it means to follow you, and especially to do so in the context of community. And then all those other things, Lord, that people are carrying, we just kind of lift them up to you. Amen. So, uh, next week is Advent. This is the weirdest thing. I don't know if you follow Advent, but this is like, we're in a couple, we're in this weird space these next couple of years where Advent, and we'll talk more about what it is and why I think it's important next week, but Advent is the four Sundays before Christmas, which means next, which, which means this year, the fourth Sunday is Christmas Eve, but for those of us Western Americans, that means that there isn't really four Sundays, there's three, and I thought about like, no, we're just, there was a season where I was, deci I had decided like, we're going to start Advent on the 26th. And then I thought, that's really ironic that you're going to submit yourself to the church calendar and then recommission it for yourself. So we're not doing that, but I'm really excited for that next week. What we are going to do this morning is, obviously, we jump back into John, and if you've not been with us before or for a bit, we started in John in September, and we said then, like, we're just going to kind of come back and forth to this. I, I, don't, I don't know if I'll live to 50. If, we, if I do, I think we'll finish it by then, but this is kind of how we're going to go. But I've been really excited for John 4 for a bit. This was instrumental for me, and I hope it can be for you as well. And it leads to this question, next slide. From where or, or from whom uh, do you receive your sentness? Now, I know that's a weird word. I made it up. I was kind of proud of it. Then I realized someone published a book. But, but by sentness, I'm not referring to your breath or your biome or your smell or stench or your feet. I'm talking about your sense of purpose. Uh, I love the archery image, even though I'm not, myself not an archery hunter. But there is something timeless about the way archery conveys a sender like there's a sending agent, uh, that there's a direction that that agent gives, there's a trajectory, there's a destination. And this morning, if, if, if I can, what I would love to do is help you begin to think about what is your sense of sentness? And for some of you, I have no doubt that you're coming out of a season where you had it very clearly and you don't right now. And my hope is that this kind of kickstarts the process or encourages one that's already there as you rediscover. For some of it, you're still checking Jesus out and maybe what you've not discovered is the great profound thing is the simplicity God brings to life by, by giving assignments, uh, by kind of Steve Jobs-esque, like you don't have to pick what shirt you're gonna wear because God helps you with that and it just gets rid of the decision fatigue a little bit. Some of you are in this season, especially if you're late teens, early 20s, where sometimes a person gets their sentness in a matter of weeks or days or months. Sometimes it can take a decade. I look back and I think one of the best pieces of advice I was ever given was my aunt who said to me in my early 20s, Adam, just stay out of debt, be careful with sex, like, don't have any babies. I'm not trying to judge anybody, but that was what she said. Like, make good decisions, follow Christ, and by 30, you'll probably have some clarity around your purpose. And that was just brilliant wisdom from, from, from me in my life. Some of you, that's where you're at. Like you, we don't always just want it and then get it the next day. I think another way to think about this isn't just archery, but like think about the coach. Maybe you've had the privilege of a coach like this, who it wasn't just about X's and O's, it wasn't just about scheme, though they were good at that. But think about the coach who, who can convey to an athlete like you belong, you've aged onto this team, you're now varsity, you're now a freshman, whatever that is, you're now 12, and you can play with these guys, you can play with these girls, you, you belong here. In a sense, that's the emotion that I kind of want to tap into, or, or outside of sport, this happens in work and vocation, whether you're training in college, or you've you got a job and someone's training you to do it, or you're in some kind of trade, again, 
Those people, and this is why when we do baby dedications, which I wish we did more of those, but when we do those, for, for me the prayer is always like, God, just bring coaches and teachers and neighbors and friends of friends into their life who just reinforce and somehow capture, and I think really what I'm getting at there is just how they're sent and, and convey to them the confidence. My friend Brian said to me years ago, uh, Adam, my job is your church planning coach. He was a friend before he was my coach, but then we formalized coaching for a few years in that. He said, my job is to give you a steel spine. And I think that's what I'm hoping for is whether you're in this kind of ironic season of suffering or you have the privilege of youth and health, whether you're in a new relationship or grieving the loss of one, that there's this, that you can somehow tap into that there is this God who loves to send and loves to bring the liberation of purpose when you wake up in the morning. I think it's in John 4. Ultimately, you'll judge whether or not you think that's true. Now, before we jump into John 4, let me just say this. If you've been thinking, man, I think I want to start reading my Bible, then I, that, I can't think of a better place to do that than John 4. I know it'll feel uncomfortable. You're starting a book in the fourth chapter. It doesn't really matter. It's not chronological anyway. But to start in John 4 and just read it, which will take as long as it just took Leslie, and, and, then, and then come back to it in the same sitting and just go slow. Sometimes I'll just force myself. I do this almost every week. I just started on week four of Lent yesterday in my quiet times and just I'll, I'll read it and then I'll go like, okay, ask five questions. And I say that to say John 4 is just loaded with layers and I have no doubt that if you give them a shot, the Holy Spirit will stop you and start teaching you. I, I'm, uh, to help me with my own kind of imposter syndrome, we can't t- possibly touch all the themes of John 4, but I want to dig into sentness and I think it starts in, in chapter in, in verse 3. We get a geographical notation. He left Judea and started back to Galilee. Now you can see there's a map, and I put that up there because I wanted to get some sense of space. Jerusalem to the northern part of the Sea of Galilee is about 120 miles, so think here to Livingston. Terrain's real similar. You'd go through some mountains. The difference is you'd go through some really dry desert, so think of here to Livingston in August. It's, it's a trek that would have been made frequently. You can see there's three different paths. We'll come to that, but you could go far east of the Jordan River. You could go far west, get along the sea or on the Mediterranean Sea. You could go right up the gut, and we'll talk about why that would have, wouldn't have been a very frequent path. Verse four, but he had to go through, he had to go through Samaria. Now this is, frankly, for me, I was parked for a couple weeks because it just kind of cracked the whole egg for me. Because if you understand boundaries, if that's a part of your way of relating, you would go like, had to? Can I help you with boundaries, please? Like if, if you're helping your kids take responsibility or if you yourself have this kind of strong aversion for victim language, you would go, had to? That's not technically accurate. Like we can see right here, there were several other options, at least two other options, which should cue us into, why does John say it this way? Jesus doesn't say it, John says it, the writer. Why does he say he had to go? And I just want to come back to that question, let you kind of see, uh, I think there'll be more ownership if you begin to develop an answer before I tell you what I think it is. But from there, so he had to go to Jerusalem, and then the next detail we learn is he bumps into this woman. Uh, She's a Samaritan woman, next slide. And there's several facts about her that uh, we're going to move too far too quickly. First of all, she's Samaritan. Now, why is that important? There's not a clearly agreed upon understanding of the history of the Samaritans But the most generally accepted theory is that when the northern tribes, there were 10 of them, when they were destroyed in the 7th century BCE by the Neo-Assyrian Empire, many were killed, many were hauled away, some were left. Then syncretism happened. People from other cultures and faith moved in, there was intermarrying, there was this mixture of faith, and eventually you ended up with the Samaritan culture and religion. And it has some elements of Judaism in it, like that they, they utilize some of the characters and even some of, some of the, what we would call the Torah, the first five books. They have a temple. They have certain sacrifices. But it wasn't Jewish. It, it, it'd be, and I, I don't mean this offensively, I just think it's true. It, it's similar to, like, say, Jehovah Witness or Mormonism today. Like, there's elements of the Bible in it. There's elements of Christian thought and thinking and life in it but they're not the same thing, they're distinct. That's the way Samaritans and the Jewish faith worked and that's what happened culturally, but that led to great violence. Imagine that, like violence in the Middle East. I know you kinda gotta stretch yourself to think like, really, that happens? It's that old. So Jesus goes there, so, there's, so he's interacting with a Samaritan, 
with a woman, which nobody needs to tell you that would have been foreign, with a woman who's labeled an adulterer, and there's good reason to spend time nuancing this because all the privilege of divorce, all the benefits of it, men experienced, women didn't. We've done this in the past. You can do a lot of kind of therapeutic theology around this story, especially people who have been through divorce because in many ways she's a victim of a system But the fact remains that in the very least, she carried the label adulterer. And in this culture, even among non-Jewish, even among the Romans, females guilty of adultery, there was nothing worse. She's that. And one of the scholars that I trust the most around John, Craig Keener is his name, he suggests that within the language itself, there's reason to at least think that part of what goes on in this interaction is she makes sexual advance on Jesus and Jesus rebuffs it. So there's lots of reasons why Jesus shouldn't be here. Why is John giving us this story? Well, one angle, next slide, is to ask this question. What's the story before the story? And I'm sorry if you weren't with us, in, on, I think it was October 29th, Or if you're not familiar with John, that's great. We're so glad you're here. There's nothing more fun than to help someone learn God through the text. But what's the story before the story? Well, next slide. It's John 3, obviously. And maybe this will spur your memory. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. It was a story about Nicodemus. You may be familiar with For God So Loved the World, He Gave His Only Son. That's in this interaction. But what do you remember about Nicodemus or what do you need to know about Nicodemus? Well, he was a ruler of Jerusalem. He's one of their vaunted leaders. He's one of their prized leaders. He's the one that shows you how to live. And he paid Jesus a visit when? In the middle of the night. Remember, he was very secretive about it. It's, it's, It's very fair to say he was ashamed of Jesus and being associated with Jesus. He was intrigued. We, we think of him as a hero, but that's only because of the way the story ends, not the way it happened in John 3. He's a ruler who's pretty secretive, and, and we explored even that week that, that he's a guy who was more interested in the way he was viewed and his popularity and his status than he was the truth, and that even in John 3, the author contrasts him with John the Baptist, and we had that whole conversation of what if it's okay to be average, not in your effort, but in your like, like skill and wiring and just the talents you're given. So Nicodemus, ashamed of Jesus, very interested in protecting his reputation. And then we get John 4, which is what? Well, Jesus walks into a forbidden land where any self-respecting Jewish person would never go. He interacts with an adulterous woman in the middle of broad daylight. And before, before anyone knows it, the whole freaking countryside knows that he was there. What's the contrast? Remember, John is all about asking people, who's your leader? Who are you following? And it's kind of like we're in the political season right now. We're going to get it endlessly. Hannah was telling me that the, was it the Senate campaign will have more money spent on it than in the history of any election in Montana. And so what's, gonna, what's happening? Well, it's the same thing happening in John. Over here you have Nicodemus. Follow him. Here's all the reasons why you should follow him. Here's how you should, you, you should understand life through his lens. Over here, you have another option. His name is Jesus. And how does he see life and people differently? What is this guy's priorities? And, and what, is, what are this guy's priorities? This for me reminds me of a guy named Dan, Matt Dampier. Next slide. He is uh, an Anglican priest in Texas. Uh, he's on a, he was on a podcast that I ha- have been following quite a bit lately, and it's a network of friends that I've been developing. Uh, Matt, I listened to this uh, because of the title, because it was, has something to do with homelessness. And I don't know about you, but I think that's probably all of us. It's just, it's perplexing right now to know what, what does... Uh, a thoughtful Christian do right now in this whole domain of the homelessness experience and how do we actually do things that are helpful? Well, Matt's podcast, or what the interview was about uh, for several years now, since 2020, after, after their morning gatherings, he takes bread and wine and he goes into his parish district because they're Anglican, they think in terms of geographical, like we have, you're in this parish whether you go to this church or not. And he goes to the people experiencing homelessness and any of them who are baptized, 
He's now doing this twice a month, him one week and somebody else the other. He offers them communion. And along the way, he, he, he talks about how he, I put this on the mind map, it's really worth listening to. He talks about how he learns their name. Uh, he prays for them. And one of the things I'd never thought of is he talks about the importance of letting them pray for him. Along the way, there's relationship and birthday parties and, and helping people. Well, I listen to this podcast, and on one level, it felt like it provided some handles of like, okay, this I could begin to get my heart around. On the other, I, I couldn't help but hear some of my friends who think about this way different than me and just hearing the cynicism, like, oh yeah, how ironic. You and your Christianness provide them a little piece of bread and a little sip of wine and call yourself helpful. So I asked him for a meeting, and it fulfilled my growing conviction that most people will give you time if you ask for it, and we scheduled a time to meet on the phone, and I just asked him that question, like, dude, way to go, this is really awesome, how are you not just feeding cynicism? And he said, well, Adam, here's the way I think about this. He said, everybody in that parish district, like, every need they would have for food, for, for, for clothing, for education, like, all of those things, he said, uh, those, those would all be met. Like they, they, those needs are provided for them within this little space. And then he used, next slide, he used a phrase I'd never heard. He said, but what I'm providing for them is their relational poverty. And he went on to explain that oftentimes what happens with the people that he serves is, sure, they might decide that they want to go get a driver's license so they can get a job, so they can kind of move forward in life. But he said th these type of people, when they walk into a space where there's a government official and a desk and a plate of glass and someone asks them a question, they just turn around and leave. He said what we've been able to do is develop relationship and when, then we go with them. And like a parent or a coach, we kind of run interference through these interactions. And then he said, and this is the great leveler because it's not just people experiencing homelessness who have this issue. Relational poverty is rampant in our culture. Then he quoted Eugene Peterson, next slide. He said, Here, here's kind of my driving thing. As numbers are to the mathematician and colors are to the landscape artist, so are names on the tongue of a Christian. Now, I've heard Eugene Peterson elsewhere say it a little bit more harshly, where he says, uh, whatever it is that you're doing, if you're doing it among people that you don't know their name, call it what you want, but it's not Christian ministry. It's a little harsh. I think it's what's going on here with Jesus. Over here, you've got Nicodemus. Over here, you've got Jesus. Now, we're never told her name. I have to believe Jesus knew it, but here's the interaction. Remember, the question we're asking is, why did he have to go there? Well, then she leads him into a religious debate, which would make sense. It's, it's safe to get back into the intellectual space. I know that better than most. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I give them will never be thirsty. The water that I give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. Again, so many awesome cultural things we could explore here. Here's one of them. In this day, the belief was, and you can go to places in the, in the Hebrew Bible and read about them, that in the final days, a river will spring forth from Jerusalem and it'll provide living water to all of Israel. Now, living water in this day is not just a metaphor for spiritual health, it's also, uh, it, 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 part of the way they grab hold of that is living water is water that has an inlet and an outlet and dead water is one that doesn't. And you know, like how often do you take a scoop of water out of a puddle and drink from it? That's, it's the ob there's some obvious stuff there. The catch is the Samaritans also had this belief but their belief was that the river would originate from somewhere in Samaria. And she kind of leads him into that debate. And what's he doing in his response? It's like classic Jesus. Affirm, affirm, but just kind of. Because what's Jesus ultimately claiming? He's claiming, I am the source. There's not gonna be this physical river as you had imagined it, it's me. I am now the provider of living water. And maybe for you there's a chance just to inventory through gratitude how that's been true for you with God. That happened to me this April when I was studying it and there's always so many questions and particularly right now, there's the war in Ukraine and just it feels like kind of this global unrest. There's rising costs of living and wages that don't keep up with that. There's so many things happening right now and I caught myself, I went back and was reading my kind of study journal and I was like, it was just so helpful to go like, oh yeah, Jesus, the living water, he, he has been faithful to me in every season. 
if, if in no other way the peace that transcends all understanding. Back to verse four, next slide. So why does the text say Jesus had to go through Samaria? Like what's the point of that statement? And it begins to get me asking, what if what we're getting at here is sentness? What if Jesus had this clarity around who he was and how he was called to use his humanness, though he certainly was also God, and that compelled him. It's like, I have to do this. Not in this like, I have no other option, but I have no other option kind of way. Craig Keener, a commentator, confirms that. Next slide. He says it this way. The necessity that compels Jesus to take this route is probably his mission. Which brings me back to my question. Can you imagine what it would be like to operate from that kind of clarity? And some of you, like, that's what you're already trying to get after. And I just, I hope this morning encourage and applauds, like, yes, go find. And others of you, you're exploring God and wondering why it matters. And I, I can't think of a more relevant reason because it, it just so brings into focus who are you and why are you here? Some of you are in this season of life where all you can do is be faithful and just keep doing the next right thing and hope that that adds up to greater clarity. But from where or from whom do you receive your sentness? And I think part of what we have to note here is that it's a result of work. I love that Jesus modeled for us this getting away alone by himself because what that tells me is that Jesus, uh, he wasn't like a superhuman character that was implanted on earth and had all that stuff just like already on the chip. Like it encourages me to know that even the savior of the world required solitude and silence to gain clarity around mission. Michael Ramsey, this uh, kind of classic old pastor guy, he says it this way, next slide. He says, there is no bypassing the psalmist's wisdom. Be still and know that I am God. And there's no bypassing the example of our Lord whom Simon Peter found praying alone in a desert place a great while before the day. And I just love the directness. You will not try to be wiser than the psalmist or wiser than our Lord. Strikes me that there's maybe nothing more important right now than just silence and solitude. And if you're someone who's really scratching for and this really appeals, in the same way that getting in shape requires certain uncomfortable physical things, gaining this kind of clarity is gonna require certain kind of uncomfortable commitments. But from where and from whom do you receive your sentence? And can you imagine, just go to that next slide, can you imagine if you had that? I, I realized in, in prepping for this, and I want to be careful because I'm not the exemplar of very much, especially very much good, but I did realize as I was studying through this, like this is a gift that I've had for most of my adult, all of my adult life. My, my parents set me up to believe in God well. At 19, I met this businessman who was also a very serious follower of Jesus and he really helped me translate that to like purpose and meaning and obedience. I, I hadn't understood that and I think everybody benefits from a non-family of origin mentor at that season of life. But you can see why I have that bias. But I, what I didn't realize was when, when, when what happened was I became employed by a church to intern in a student ministry and I wasn't even raised in that environment. I always had Fred in the background and even though I had bosses and people on the ground with me in that space, I always had Fred in the background just giving me my purpose, sending me back out there. Like, like, like the athlete who just got like rocked, he was the one going, okay, get back out there. You can do this. And that carried for quite a while until the conversation shifted in my guts to planting a church and there was a community of us that started talking about that and Fred's not a pastor, he's a business person and so really my, my, I didn't realize again until recently that that emotional place transferred back to Vern and Brian who were these pastors I'd worked for for a long time and they came alongside and planted this church and my friend Brian who I'd known him since I was 19, when I asked him to kind of formally be the church planning coach, he said, Adam, my job is to give you a steel spine and I had no idea until I was processing all this that for those first four or five years of Narrate, in addition to lots of other people on the ground in the space with me, it was so huge to have Brian kind of affirming vision this, like, kind of, even if it was just a phone call, kind of going back to camp and then being sent back out to battle, if you will. 
And then life happened and he moved to California to pastor a church and while we're still in contact, relational distance occurred. And I didn't realize at the time that when I decided to go back to the seminary that I'd graduated from, it was an attempt to, to reattach to a sending agent. That seminary in many ways taught us, Brian and I, how to do church as we're doing it. And so it was really life-giving to be in that space, having kind of graduated a while ago and now going back to school and processing and building relationship with faculty and staff. And there were all kinds of kind of attaboys that happened because we were doing, and they were like, for them, it was affirming to go like, oh, what we've been saying works. And that was a great thing. And then COVID happened and faculty started to graduate and I graduated a second time and wrapped that up. And then I realized, and again, I realized all this in April, that, that that for me is why there's this affinity for this C4SO crew. Uh, not that that has any effect on the ground here, but just I needed to reattach to that sentness. Uh, people not here, not in this space, who, who could affirm and encourage and send out. And I say all that to say, so how do you get there? And there's probably not an easily prescripted, impersonal way. It probably requires a lot of work on your part to go, okay, Lord, how and who? And I almost guarantee if it's worthwhile, there's, there's a who or several who's attached. But can you imagine, and I think this was what was driving Teresa's dream when she unearthed all the purpose living work. Can you imagine what would happen to be a part of a community of people who tomorrow morning go off to school and sport and work, change more diapers, go back to doing what it is we do with this sense of being sent, with this sense of scattering, know, knowing that ministry doesn't always happen when there's a cross in the logo or you work for a church, but that like, that's what we get to be is these people in community called and sent out and then gathering back together. And so my prayer for you this week would be uh, that you'd either be affirmed in your desire for it or affirmed in what you already have or that you'd just leave going, okay, I'm kind of in day one of the rest of my life and it's gonna take some work to get back there, but please, Jesus, give me the courage and energy to do that. I can think of no other better way to step into that than through communion uh, because if you think about it, communion is in many ways worth celebrating the sent son of God staying true to mission. John talks from early on, he had this sense of his day was coming where death would happen and victory over death would be the result. And when we celebrate his body broken, his blood poured out, in many ways we're celebrating his faithfulness to God's mission to him and how that rescues us. So if you've not taken communion with us before, just hot, by way of kind of quick hospitality, we'll have bread over here and wine and juice over here and we'll loop through a road this way. Uh, if you're wondering if you're invited, the answer is to the extent that you're an active follower of Jesus, yes. Uh, we encourage you to, to partake with us. Also, uh, we'll, if you just kind of hold it and we'll take it together after a couple songs. So I'd like to pray. God, Lord, the awesome thing about something like this is we're all in so many different seasons of life. Some of us have most of it ahead of us and many of us are well aware that we're half done, if not more, some of us are kind of living high and healthy and others trying to figure out what it looks like to, to be faithful to you with a limp. And so Jesus, uh, my prayer would be that this would kickstart and spark uh, and encourage and affirm a process of, of personal clarity from you. And Jesus, we, we, like, we know the story is that we offer you our ordinary everyday lives you send your spirit into us and us into the world. And in the same way, God, we offer you this bread and this wine, would you please send your spirit into, into these, this bread and this wine and, and in doing into us and to fuel us with your spirit into a life of service for others. God, help us learn some names this week. Uh, we love you, Jesus. Amen. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to learn more about Narrate Church, find us online at narratechurch.org or look us up on Facebook or Instagram.